All right. Well, as uh, as I was preparing for this week, uh, so I, I read different things that are that are I don't know probably not interesting at all to anybody. Uh, I don't think the idea of isolation is new to anybody. Anybody know that there's an issue where people are feeling isolated in our country? Anybody not know that? Okay, so that's not new. What I found interesting, though, and I don't know why, like I said, but I've started reading these, these articles about cell phones in schools. Why? I don't know. Um, I, I really, I, I don't have a reason. Um, I find just the, the research on it interesting and how it's impacted education and learning and and theories. A lot of it is theories, not necessarily a definitive known one way or another. And what was interesting in one of these stories I was reading uh, was from a school out on the, the East Coast, out by, in Boston area, and it was a middle school um, principal. And this middle school principal had asked for permission from the school board to try an experiment. And that experiment was uh, that there was these bags that they're using, and they're using them all around the country now, but, but where the kids put their phones in it at the beginning of the day, and the only way to unlock it is there's these, these magnet things that get turned on outside the doors as they leave, and they hold the bag up, it allows it to open, and they can pull their phone out. Um, we all know that there's teenagers, and he acknowledged this, and teenagers bring dummy phones and find ways to break rules. And so I, I'm not saying it's a perfect system, but they've tried this. My point isn't the system in saying that Flanders should do it or Coleman should do it or anybody else should do it, but what I found interesting in this is he talked about how the first three days or so after they did this, there was a lot of resistance from parents, from, from, teach, uh, from students, and from, from just the, the, is this going to work, and what, what, you know, and just kind of anxiousness and anxiety that, that I, this phone that I've come used to having and so accustomed to, I now don't have access to. And he said what was interesting, though, is after that third day, what they saw is kids started actually talking to each other. And, and there was more connection in the classrooms. And, and, and they were making friends and, and joking and doing things that, that hadn't been happening prior to this, at least at, not at this level. Because one of this administrator's concerns was the isolation that's happening with students. We are more connected now than ever, and if you know me at all, you know I love, I love my technology. Th this last week, I was able to have a call with Richard on WhatsApp. I was able to Zoom with my mom's side of the family, where some are in Florida, some are in Texas, and I was here. I I've been able to exchange messages with a variety of people in a variety of different places, uh, all thanks to technology. So technology isn't a bad thing. Technology can allow connection um, where it once wasn't, but it can also be something that it can be isolating. And as we, we look at isolation and, and our tendency to, to get drawn into just ourselves, we see a negative impact in the church. Now, I'm not going to go down the road uh, uh, of telling you not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's not where I'm going to go with this message. Instead, I'm going to uh, jump into our series where we've been talking about core values and core values uh, versus aspirational values. Core values are those values that are, are who you are. They, they truly are, are the values that you live out. They're just part of your being. Now, now aspirational values are values that, that are ones that you wish were true and may one day be true and they one day may become a core value, but for now they're just kind of, I want it to be a value of mine. I, I hope that it becomes a truth that is in my life, or that is something that I am uh, living out and, and, and making mine. And as we've looked at these core values versus aspirational values, we've seen that, that in the Rescue Church, we desire to make sure that our values, who we are, is based on not feelings, not social influences, but truly based on Scripture. Because the truth of Scripture is God's Word. And if God is God, and we looked at God being God, and why we believe God is God, and the Bible is His Word, and we looked at why we can know that it is His Word, then that is a very, very solid place to start from. So if you are at this point wrestling with, do I believe that? Do I understand that? Do I know that? Um, I'm not going to get too much into that today. 
You can go back to our message a couple of weeks ago, and I do go through and, and lay some of that out. Why? I'm happy to have those conversations with you as well. Just know that I'm going to step into this on the assumption that God's word is truth and that God is God. And even if you don't believe that, there will be other things that apply to your life through this. All right, we're going to get into Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. And last week, we, we jumped into our first core value, which was reaching lost people with the gospel. And obviously, uh, Matthew 28 falls into that. It's probably the most common passage that you would see used. But we're going to dig into this in a little bit bigger uh, with all three verses of 18 through 20. I know, huge, three verses. Actually, 18, 19, yeah, three verses. All right, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. A lot has happened at this point. I mean, this is near the end of, of Jesus' time here on earth. And so the, he's experienced a lot. His followers have experienced a lot. And they're about to experience more because Jesus is about to leave earth and ascend to heaven. When I, uh, and I, I have loved retail. I loved retail management. I did this for years. Um, and one of my earlier ones was with a company that was bought by another company that would end up being bought by another company that is Luxottica. Luxottica is the company that um, they own some of the Pearl Vision stuff. They own... Uh, like Oakley sunglasses, Ray-Ban sunglasses. They own uh, um, Lens Crafter, Sunglass Hut. Uh, I can't even think of all of the things that they own or have an ownership share in. And when they bought the company that I was a part of as a district manager, uh, I had uh, been working with them for a while. Things were going good. I have nothing bad to say. And then I was on my way up to Fargo to meet with uh, some of my managers, I was going to make a loop through all of North Dakota, which if you've been in North Dakota, you know how much fun that loop is when you go over to Bismarck, up to Minot, over to Grand Forks and back. It's a blast. If you haven't, ha haven't done it, you haven't had fun yet. You haven't lived. Right, Paul? That, yeah, see? Yeah. You just there. Yeah. So, so you know the fun. So I'm, I'm on my way up there. I'm about halfway to Fargo, and I get this phone call. And this phone call says, Sam, you need to be in Chicago tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, Chicago's this way. I'm going this way. They said, we'll get you a ticket. You fly out in the morning. So I turned around, went back. I'm like, what is going on? So the next morning, I fly to Chicago. And it wasn't everybody, but there was about 800, 900 of us. And uh, we walk into this big conference room and get told, hey, your jobs have been eliminated. Your positions are done. Um, and... Of course, that's like a, oh, and they're like, okay, you're going to meet with the attorneys, they'll be in the other room, and the HR people, they'll get you all taken care of. Good day. And that's the end of it. And you're like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a shock. If you've ever been through like a mass layoff like that, that is, a, that is tough. And to be on the flip side and having to be the one doing the laying off is also tough. But this, that's not what this is about. What happened after that is I got home, and, and I'll be just very clear just so it doesn't sound like I'm disparaging a company I worked for. Um, they took really good care of us, actually, and I was uh, very well treated. And in fact, in the end of that story, uh, they actually came to me and apologized, said they made a bad decision based on bad information, and they would like me to come back. I could name anywhere in the country I wanted to go, they'd make it happen. Um, we stayed in Minnesota. I don't know what that says. Um, anyway, but so this company was, was good to me. But before, you know, after I'd gotten the word of the layoff, and I'm calling all these managers, people that have worked for me for years, people who I've known, many of them I've hired, I've worked to develop, I, I know about their families, I know the things they're going through, um, walk through one of them going through rehab uh, with addiction, and it's like all of this stuff, and you're like, it's all swirling around, and one of my managers said to me, Sam, we'll all walk, we'll, we'll all walk, we'll, we'll show them that this is a bad decision. I'm like, hold, hold, wait, hold on a second. Time out, that, that's a bad idea. I was flattered, don't get me wrong. There was a part of me like, like yeah, they love me. Um, but there was another part that goes, that's terrible. You all have families to provide for. They haven't done anything unethical. Stick it out, see what happens. 
And uh, at the very least, if you're going to make a move, wait till you have a plan, not just, hey, we're cutting off and we're running. Why I bring that up is when Jesus had spent all of this time with his people and he was getting ready to leave, they had a question of what comes next. Just like my manager were like, what comes next? The, the person who's helped us get to where we are at is not going to be here. Now what? And so Jesus in that moment has a much better conversation than I had with my managers and says, hey, let's sit down and let's talk about this. Let's talk about what's coming next and what I want from you. After all, Jesus has just done the impossible. Um, he's died and then risen again three days later. I mean, that, that, that's pretty impossible. And in this, this period of, of him doing the impossible, his friends, those that were closest to him, had said, uh, with the exception to what we can tell of the Apostle John, who stood with him and, and was with him through the whole thing, with the exception of John, they bailed. They disappeared. They weren't there for him. Maybe they were at a distance by, by some of the readings, but they weren't there walking through it with him. In fact, to make it worse, you've got Peter, who has said, not only said, hey, I'm going to back off, I'm not going to be near this, Peter's even denied knowing him. He's been like, okay, yeah, I'm out. Um, and they're like, oh, this is your best friend, right? This is the, not even your best friend. You know this guy. He's like, nope, don't have a clue. Hey, you're where, you were with him. No, I wasn't. Three times denies him. And yet, in this time since the resurrection, Jesus has come back and restored those relationships. He's met those people where they're at. He's given Peter a chance to say that, uh, that, that three times that, that he denied him, he's now given him three times to affirm his love. All of this has happened. There's been this whirlwind. And then Jesus is getting ready to leave. Now, I, I do want to pause here, though, on, on Peter for a second, because it may be a a word for somebody and just say if you're at a spot where in your life where you're going hey I've kind of wandered away too I've kind of stepped back away from God I uh, you know things hadn't been going real well so I disappeared I want to just encourage you he will invite you back he wants you back he will welcome you back and as a church we want that to be our attitude if you leave for a reason unhappy upset whatever we want to be a church that is welcoming back and are willing to restore relationships okay anyway but moving on from that so jesus has done all of this and now getting ready to leave again this time this time his followers aren't running away this time they're all in they're like hey we're here what's next what do you have for us to do and, and instead of saying nope i got nothing i'm gone he says here's what i've got to do i've got a i've got a plan and i've got a challenge to you. In fact, I am inviting you in to being part of what I am doing and what I want to do. A good boss is willing to share responsibilities. A good leader shares responsibilities. Jesus takes that to a whole new level and says, hey, I've got the most important responsibility in, the, in, in all of creation uh, of, of telling people about me. And I'm inviting you to be a part of it. I'm inviting you into what I'm doing. But Jesus says not, hey, I'm, I'm doing it and I'm out. I'm giving it to you and I'm out. He says, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. I'm sending you a helper. Now, earlier in John, in John 14, 26, he had actually said that the Holy Spirit is a helper. So as he's saying, hey, I'm going to send to you a Holy Spirit, they don't go, Okay, that's great. What's that mean? They have a reference to draw back to and go, wait, he said he's a, a helper. We still don't know what he's going to help us with or how he's going to help us, but at least he's sending help and he's going to help us accomplish what he is calling us to do. And then we get into what he calls them to do and he says, go and make disciples. So clearly we're called to go and make disciples. We probably need to start back at what is a disciple. Because if I'm telling you to go do something but not explaining what it is that I'm telling you to do, we're probably going to have a little confusion and it's probably not going to get done very well. So a disciple is simply a pupil or follower who applies what they're taught. A pupil or follower who applies what they are taught.
taught. That's what a disciple is. We've referenced this as a, it's kind of like being a, an apprentice. Um, that's the idea. And so Jesus says, hey, I, I'm calling you first to share the good news. We talked about that. Miles talked about that last week. He said, sharing the good news, uh, telling people about Jesus, telling what he's done. I loved his comment and his reference to the fact that we as the church sometimes get hung up on, hey, we want people to come to us so that we can tell them about Jesus, when in reality, we as the church go into a lot of places where there are a lot of people, and so we can bring the hope of Jesus and the hope of the gospel to our jobs, to our schools, to our friend groups, to our communities. Wherever we are, we can bring the hope of the gospel. And if we, as all of us in this room, brought the hope of the gospel to where we go during a week, we will have a much bigger influence and a much bigger impact than if we say, okay, I hope there's people that show up inside the door so that I can tell them about Jesus. That's the gospel. That's, or that's sharing the gospel. The gospel is the good news. It's the good news that Jesus came to offer a relationship and offer forgiveness and offer hope and offer healing. But I'm getting back into last week's message, so let me move forward. So, so that's the gospel part. He says, go and make disciples. Well, okay, so we've got the gospel, and then we've got making disciples. It can't end with us simply having someone say, hey, I am going to follow Jesus. Hey, I believe. Hey, I said a prayer. I'm done. I raised my hand in a service. I walked to the front, whatever. It's not true faith. A true relationship with God does not end with a prayer or a raising of a hand or of a coming forward to the front. A true faith results in action. The reason I know this, I said we're going to go back to the Bible. I'm going to go back to the Bible. James 1.17 says, Faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. Faith without actions is dead, so it's not really real. So if there is no actions, it's an indication that there really was no faith. Now that's a harsh lesson and a hard lesson to learn. Let me, let me make it a little bit harsher. James also says, even the demons believe and tremble. So believing isn't the end of the story. Believing is the beginning of the story. Begin, believing and accepting is the start. I say it's the start not because your actions or your works are going to do anything to save you. They're not. Not because you can earn God's approval. You can't. But because when we meet Jesus, when we truly connect with him and make him Lord of our lives, it will impact the way we live. It will impact our lives. So, we know that, that faith and, and the gospel, we, we put our hope in Jesus, and then we know that that should start to translate into action. And I was thinking of how to say this, and I started to say, okay, growth doesn't happen in a vacuum. And then I realized, well, vacuum, what does that even mean? Um, and then I thought of how Lee would interpret that in our deaf campus, and I thought, that's going to be difficult. So here's what I, what I said. I said, growth is a process that does not happen separate from outside events or influences. Growth is a process that does not happen separate from outside events or influences. Jesus says to his, dis his disciples, his followers, he says, teach them. Teach them. He, he's not expecting that, that when when a person comes to a relationship with him that they're just left out on an island, but he's expecting that we teach them. And not he didn't say just teach them a little bit. Hey, just give them a little bit of something to get going and, and then move on to the next thing. I think some of, a, some of the, our, our services is when we can get really evangelical, really outreach focused, we get to that part and we're like, hey, we just need to give them a little bit and then we're going to move on to the next thing. But somebody has to disciple, to, to develop that faith. And Jesus said, teach everything that I've taught you. Not just teach a little bit, teach everything. Now keep in mind, Jesus had been with them for more than three years teaching them. And, and hours upon hours, there's a lot of information to teach. And Jesus says, teach them everything. This is going to take time. It's going to take 
uh, uh, a lot of time, probably. And it's probably not going to be easiest on our own. It's probably going to be best with a team. And that's where the church comes in. And God has said, hey, you need to be teachers and mentors. You, you need to step in and teach these people who come to a relationship with me. You need to make disciples. We, we say, I say, we say a lot that our faith isn't designed to be in an isolation. We weren't designed to live in isolation. Um, we were created to be interdependent versus independent. Any of those things. God, in his wisdom, knew the value of community and the value of connection. And part of the responsibility of the church, us as followers of Jesus, is to spend time teaching and mentoring other believers. It's part of why we say uh, in our core values that, that we value equipping saved people to follow Jesus. But what's it look like to equip saved people to follow Jesus? That sounds good. Um, you know, hey, we're going to make disciples. That's, that sounds churchy, so we're good. But, but what does it really mean, or how do we do it? I think there's, there's multiple reasons or multiple parts. I've got three down on your note sheets. One of them is we have to start by being teachable, by being teachable. And, and what I mean by that is if a person is truly going to be a disciple, they have to want to learn. They have to have a desire to learn. And what my experience has been and I would guess maybe many of you have had similar experiences. When somebody follows Jesus, they are hungry to learn. They want to know more. They want to talk to more people about it. They want, they want to have some conversations. Probably sometimes to the point where you're like, oh my goodness, this is exhausting. But, but at the same point, there's a lot. that They've just got a hunger and a thirst for that knowledge and that information. They've got to be teachable. And... Uh, and they have to be willing to learn. Now, the responsibility, I can't force you to learn. If I was to go up to Kurt and say, hey, I am going to force you to be a disciple, and he's like, all right, I'm not interested. I can't make it happen. I can try. I can continue to build the relationship. But he isn't going to change unless he is willing to learn. He isn't going to grow unless he's willing to be taught. He may have knowledge, he may have all that, but it won't affect his life if he isn't teachable. I had a friend um, who I met with for months to illustrate this point. Um, I didn't meet with him to illustrate this point, but my meeting with him illustrates this point. Anyway, I met with him, and this was a guy who uh, was a friend of mine, a uh, follower of Jesus, but was really in a bad spot. Um, he would claim God um, just hadn't given him a purpose or... He didn't know his purpose, and God wasn't speaking to him, and his life was messed up, and things were bad because he was following Jesus. And so I started meeting with this guy um, multiple hours a week. Um, intentionally, it was supposed to be like an hour, but it always went longer. And, uh, and I was seeing them at different times as well. And we would sit down, and we, we found some some. First, we were sitting down just kind of trying to study and go through some sort of Bible teaching. I said, okay, this is not working. Let's try something else. And I found a resource that has been used by many people throughout the world and said, okay, we're going to use this resource in addition to the first resource, which was the Bible. Uh, we're going to use this other resource, and we're going to walk through this, and we're going to work on developing uh, an understanding that God does have a purpose for you and looking at what could that purpose be. And after meeting with them repeatedly over and over again, what, what I ran into was all the reasons why none of this would work in their life. They weren't receptive. They came into every meeting telling me why everything was a bad idea and why, why this wasn't working and why woe was me and why this is bad. And after a couple of months of this, that person ended up... Um, pretty much walking away from God, making a bunch of bad decisions, and is still making bad decisions to this day. They weren't teachable. They weren't open to teaching. I couldn't, you couldn't, nobody can force a person to learn if they're not willing and open to learning, if they're not willing and open to growing. I could question whether or not 
those people are even following Jesus because the Holy Spirit can do those things, but that's a different conversation. We also must be willing to invest in ourselves. What I mean by this is if we're going to do mentoring, if we're going to teach people, we have to have something to teach people. We have to be able to have something to give. And if we haven't grown, we, haven't been, we aren't able to give. It's a reason why if we look in that, that first, that's, uh, the, the first Timothy passage that we've been studying, when we see in first Timothy where Paul talks about elders being people who are more mature, more experienced Christians, have been, in, have been following Jesus longer, is because it, they have to have the, the learning and the growth and the knowledge to be able to pour into someone else. And sometimes that ideal is impossible, but when it is, that is the way that you want it to be. You want those mature Christians plugging into other people who are plugging into other people. And, and when, we, when we do that, that, then we're able to grow, which leads us to the, the next thing, which is we got to connect with people, because if we're not connecting with people, all that growth and all that knowledge and all that stuff that we're bringing into ourselves, we can't pour out into somebody else. I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, we have split Jess Bowman's position here with the Rescue Church into two spots. We did it for, for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons was that as a church, we believe that God has us here for the long haul, not just for this generation, not just for the next generation, but that God's going to continue to work. And if God is going to continue to work, we need to be uh, making plans for the future. And part of what we've been running into is when Jess took over for Chris, then, then there was, she had to go through and learn it all and kind of learn it on her own. Now, we took steps and we said, okay, we're going to take steps and we're going to progress and we're going to create processes and if we have those, it's going to make it easier. We're going to write things down, and that'll make it easier. And it does, but you still need somebody to teach you how to do the things that are in those processes. And so the idea came with, what if we split this position into two, with two people learning how it, it works, learning all the intricacies of it, so that if something happens to one, there's somebody else that can cover, because they, they know how to do it. They may do other things better, but they know how to do this, and vice versa. And so then what happens is if in this situation, heaven forbid, that, that Kelly gets hit by a bus, well, well we still have, <laughs> was that the example that we thought we were going <laughs> to, so we, we could change it. If for some reason Kelly's kayak flips upside down and doesn't come back up, well, we'll change it. It's not a bus. Same outcome. <laughs> okay, Eve says, or Kelly goes on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> a little less dramatic, I suppose, um, but that there's somebody else that knows how to do that side. And conversely, if something happens and, and Lexi's not able to do it, Kelly can cover. And even bigger than that, if one of them is, moves on in a, a different stage in life, there's still that other person that can teach the person because there's somebody with experience. There's somebody that can mentor then that next person coming up, and we're not starting from scratch every single time. In the church, when we have people around us, we can invest in people with, where we learn from their experiences. And then as we become more experienced, then other people can learn from our experiences. And we're still learning from this person who's still got more experiences. And so we're continuing to grow and we're bringing people with us and continuing to build. I shared this with someone recently and they said, hey, it's kind of biblical, you know that? They said, hey, have you heard of Elijah? In Elisha, you know, Elijah mentors Elisha for years before Elijah is ascending to heaven in a chariot of fire. How cool is that? And, and Elisha takes on his responsibilities. Or another biblical example, you got Moses. For years, obviously, it was him and Aaron serving together. But there was this guy named Joshua that was tagging along and learning. And, and this guy that he was trusting with responsibilities like, hey, we're supposed to take over this country and this land. You go check it out and come back and report. And so when it comes time for Joshua to lead, Joshua's already been mentored and trained and can step into that role. We looked at this in 1 Timothy. And when we talked about Timothy trained by Paul. 1 Corinthians 4.16, we see that further as it applies to the whole church. And it says, therefore, I urge you to imitate me. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, who is faithful in the Lord. So wait, wait. So, so what Paul's saying is, hey, you, you've all followed Jesus. 
I've been mentoring this guy, Timothy. Timothy knows how to live because I've taught him. He can take what I've taught him and bring it to you and teach you. Anyway, and he says, he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in the church. So these are some really good examples. I'll give you the ultimate example, and it's where we started today. It's Jesus. Jesus didn't just pick people and say, hey, I'm going to have you go tell people about me and teach them and whatever. I'm out. See ya. He instead says, hey, I'm going to spend years with these people, day and night, teaching them, investing with them, dealing with their garbage and their drama and all of that. They're going to desert me. I'm going to welcome them back. I'm going to reaffirm them. At that point, I am going to send them because they will have been taught and they will know and they will be able to share. So we need to have those connections. We need to continue to develop those connections. We need to invest in people. We need to have people we're investing in. And what better place to do that than the church, connecting with people. And I'm not talking on a Sunday service specifically. I'm saying in general with the body of Christ, we need to be intentional about connecting. There's another thing, though, and I don't have it on your sheet, and I probably should have, and it's that we need the right tools and resources. Now, what that looks like can be, be different. Um, I was thinking about it, and so I'll brag a little bit. Micah and his team won state baseball yesterday, and um, so, but it would have been interesting if their coach throughout, like, the, the really boring t-ball years up to the still really boring coach pitch years. And, and on through the years, it said, okay, go out, play baseball. And here's what you got to do. You got to catch that ball. And said, but I'm not going to give you anything to do it with. Just go out and figure it out. Use your hand. Um, some of them would probably be okay. Some of them would probably end up with broken hands, including like catchers. But, but you got to have tools. I can imagine when, when uh, you've got somebody, and I know this is a little antiquated, but, but if you had Steve going out and saying, okay, I'm going to teach somebody how to build something. And here's what you need to do. You need to cut this to this size. You need to, to frame this up, and you need to put some nails in it. But, but you, don't get a, you don't get to measure it. Just eyeball it. It'll be fine. Um, some of our houses probably feel like they're built that way. And then uh, yeah, you don't get a hammer for the nails. Uh, use your head. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it is. But, but if we were to say, hey, we're going to tell you to do these things without giving you anything to do it, you're going to struggle. So we as the church need to look at how we can empower and provide the right tools for people to follow Jesus. What does that look like? What are those tools? What are some of those? Um, it can be a variety of things. Um, one of the things that we provide is access to Right Now Media. Right Now Media has resources for a person to be able to lead a Bible study or to do a study on your own, whichever would work best for you or in your situation. Um, we provide a, a weekly service where we can connect and get a chance to learn from each other and go through things that way. We have, uh, uh, as a church, we have a Love Your Neighbor Fund where we have funds set aside saying, hey, we're telling you to go out and live this. We're going to help provide you some funds to be able to do it because sometimes you need some help to get there. It means that we get behind ministries and, and, and missions and we say, hey, uh, Bill, I know you want to bring these people and I know God's calling you to, to this and Kristen and, and you're going to do this. We're going to try and do our part to help make that happen with raising funds for Warrior Leadership Summit. We've got a group in Deeside, Jamaica, who is working to, to serve their community so that their community knows that they are loved. But it doesn't work real well if we say, hey, yeah, go out and feed and help and take care and mentor. Um, yeah, I know the reason you need this is because there's not a lot of funds, but we're not helping you with that. Good luck. Um, so we provide funds. People put in their time. That's a huge resource. A huge resource as far as the time to spend mentoring somebody so that they are able to go out and do stuff. The, the uh, availability of someone when they have questions to know that, hey, I can call and talk to this person, this mentor, because I know they're available. One of the things with Hope Recovery is that you, you need to have a sponsor. And at the very least, you need accountability people because you need people you can go to and ask questions who can be a resource for you to help you as you continue to grow in your recovery. There's also our gifts, abilities, all that. We need to be able to invest those 
in other people and help them build their abilities, giving them a chance to use what God has given them. Okay, so all of that, let's wrap up. I just want to answer a few questions. If, if this is important, well, let's start with this one. Is it truly a core value of the rescue church? Is this something that we, we truly are doing, or is it just aspirational that we're saying? I think that's a question that we need to answer. Another question that we probably need to, uh, another question we need to think about is, if I'm not doing this, why am I not doing it? Am I not doing it because I don't know how? Is it I'm not doing it because I haven't been shown how? Or is it flat out just disobedience? I know what I need to do. I'm just choosing not to do it because, you know, it's a little hard. It's inconvenient. Um, it gets in the way of me doing what I want to do, you know. Um, is it because I don't realize how much God loved me, that he was willing to give his son, and he was willing to give everything for me? And so as a result, that love should cause me to want to give and invest in other people. But if it's not happening, why not? And if we want it to happen, and if we, we want to see us as a church grow, and I don't mean just the rescue church, but even if we want to see the body of Christ grow, we need to reach out and connect with people, like Miles talked about, but not just leave them there at, hey, I've, I've told them about Jesus and they've made a decision, but spend time walking with them, growing and developing, and then we get that multiplication thing. Because as we invest in them and they start growing and developing and they invest in others and they start growing and developing, we reach more and more people through a multiplication factor, a multiplication opportunity. So as we wrap up, I'll summarize it this way. Are you obedient? Are you teachable? Are you investing in others? And are you taking time to invest in yourself? Let's pray. God, um, we want to be like you. We want others to experience the joy of knowing you, the hope of following you, the peace only you can provide, the insight only you can give. God, I just pray that um, you would work in us as a church and us as people, that we would be obedient, but not just obedient, God, that you would change our hearts, you would mold our hearts, that you would make us people who want to grow with other people and want to bring other people along. Prepare us, equip us, teach us, and make us like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you in your faith journey. To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses. If you'd like to learn more about The Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com or email us at office at therescuechurch.com.